please let me introduce Scott Bales to come up and speak. Scott is the global leader, um, thought leader on the intersection between cultural and behavioral changes. He's creating new technologies and innovation, and Scott is director of a boutique advisory firm called User Strategy with the best-selling bank 2.0 author Brett King. So he's also the innovations director for uh, and a co-founder of Next Bank Asia and a recognized global leader in the influential thought leader of mobility in the financial services. So one of the things that is high on Scott's radar right now is uh, building the first, uh, world's first mobile-centric bank. Please, Scott. Thanks, William. Thanks for uh, having me here today. Uh, it's actually quite good. I don't regularly get to speak in Singapore, so unless I make the event myself. So this, this is actually quite, you know, quite a good to actually explore the, the market here in Singapore. Uh, Singapore, you know, to me is, has, a, has a special place in my heart. It's a good hub for Asia, one of the most exciting places in the world to do business right now. Um, so, you know, you're all, you know, privileged to us opportunities, which I'm going to show you later, uh, right here in Singapore. But um, what I really want to talk about is an opinion which I've been building, and some of you may have seen this in my blog in recent days, is that the modern bank, and I mean everything from Citigroup down to your local bank, is, to me, become, it got to a point of being what I call blind and dependent. They can no longer see the changes which Mel just outlines in the fast-pacing world. They're not paying attention to them. You know, one of those things I keep saying is, I've been speaking to banks for 10 years about their response to PayPal. PayPal's 12th birthday was two months ago. Okay? 12 years and still no response. The idea of dependency as well, coming up with excuses around, oh, my regular hasn't, regulator hasn't told me what to do. Compliance says I can't do it. There's no case for mobile. There's no case for the underbanked. It's around becoming an organization of essentially blind and blind dependents. So I'm actually going to take you through a story of why this is so significant, why this could potentially be one of the largest tipping points in the financial industry, basically in the last couple of, couple of centuries. And to help me tell that story, I've got a few characters. Our first one here is Isaac Lim. Isaac Lim was born the 29th of June, 2007. Now, does anyone in the room can tell me the significance of that date? Was it, I heard it? He's born the same day as the iPhone. The iPhone, remember, has not been around very long, but is one of the most significant leap forwards in technology that's affected banking in the last 10 years. Now, Isaac is born into a world where he will never, ever see Encyclopedia Britannica. Encyclopedia Britannica in publication in print for 244 years, longer than most of your banks, now is no longer printed. He will never see a product catalogue. Product catalogues are being you know, thrown out the door from your, from your retailers, from your brands. You know, they're, just, they're just noise now in, in your junk mail. In fact, you know, it's actually gotten to the point now, people check their email more than they check their mailbox. He's born into a, he'll never go to a peep show because there's better digital alternatives. <laughs> He'll never use a paper classified because Craigslist is now one of the biggest classifieds in the world. He'll probably never even know what the Yellow Pages is or a landline. The landlines globally are decreasing at such rapid rates that telcos are like, what do I do? This is our core business. There's this new technology that came out a little while ago, the fax machine. He will probably doesn't even know what a fax machine is. He'll probably never use one. But then some really compelling ones which will touch to your heart. He'll never use an optical disc. He'll never have a DVD, a CD in his life, ever. He'll never use cabled networking. That's a, this is like a 10, year, 10, 15 year old technology that he'll never use. He'll never go to a bookstore and he'll never go to a movie, a movie rental place. These businesses are now dead. Why? Because they have a historical dependency on bricks and mortar distribution. The idea that you would actually go to somewhere to do something, as Mel just mentioned, and banking and various industries are now being disintimated by the idea of digital distribution. Who else do we know that uses bricks and mortar? The industry we have here today. The reality is that the products that banks distribute today have no physical tangibility and are susceptible to digital disintermediation. There is nothing stopping right now changing the distribution of money and financial products to a completely digital world. Okay, so this idea that branches are going to play an important role that you know, the baby boomers are going to be around for the, going to keep branches alive for the next 20 years is actually very naive. Because if you keep believing that way, you're going to go, like the, you're going to go the same way these guys went. Out of business. And Borders, the largest seller of books in the world for nearly 10 years. Out of business today. 
interesting statistic, and I, I, unfortunately there's not many stats on Asian yet, Asian markets yet, but 88% of the Swedish market never went to a bank branch in 2011. Never went. In fact, in a lot of cases, they choose alternative providers to avoid going to a bank branch. Again, back to our little, back to our little Isaac. He'll never write a check. Never ever will he write a check. It's a, hard, it's a hard concept to grasp. My business partner, Brett, continually tells the story of his 11-year-old of his daughter, Hannah. Brett's lived in three cities. He's lived in Dubai, Hong Kong, and now New York. Hannah's best friend lives in Dubai. On, on her best friend's birthday, Brett goes to Hannah, Hannah, what would you like to do for, let's say it's Chloe's birthday? She goes, let's send her some money. And so Brett goes to Hannah, how would you like to do that? Well, it's easy, Daddy. We'll just email it or SMS it. And Brett goes to her, how about this? Why don't we take a $100 bill? We'll go down to the bank. They'll exchange it for a piece of paper with Chloe's name on it. We'll put it in an envelope, put it in the post, send it across to Dubai. She'll go to her bank and they'll give her 100 US dollars at her end. Now, we all know what I'm describing. I'm describing a check. Hannah's response was, no, Daddy, that'll never work. Who would do that? So back to Isaac. Very important statistic. Globally recognised that every consumer in the world chooses their primary banking relationship between the ages of 16 to 18 and overwhelmingly never changes that in their life. Little Isaac here will choose his bank in 2023. Are you ready to bank him knowing all those things he has no idea about? No checks, no branches. His service choice will be based on those premises because he doesn't understand anything else. Here's his little buddy, Timmy. Born 20, the 21st of November in 2000. Any of know the significance of this date? No? The very first smartphone. The Nokia communicator. Okay, this, again, hasn't been around very long. Only 12 years have we been able to do enriched kind of applications on a mobile device. But they have changed our world completely in just 12 years. Timmy will choose his primary bank in the year 2017. Other than that, he's actually also born the same day as PayPal. Local family here, two children, Ethan and Isabel. First of all, let's have a look at Ethan. Ethan is born the 10th of November, 2010. Happens to be the same day as the iPod. Now this iPod looks pretty old these days, doesn't it? But it's only 11 years old. Ethan will choose his primary banking relationship for life in 2017. That's just five years away. His big sister is born the same day as Google. The very company we're in right today. And she will choose her bank in just two years' time. And she has very similar expectations of services and so forth of growing up in a world with Google around. Google is an expe is a, is a intrinsic uh, expectation of service providers that drives her world. Just like Facebook does for a lot of people. The idea of having a smartphone, mobile internet. These shape these people's minds of how they evaluate and expect their service providers to act. So let's take back again. Let's take at some, some good market trends around where these kids are growing up and what's shaped where they are today. There's no doubt in the last 10 years, consumers have got digital. I can almost say, you know, unequivocally, every one of you in this room has a digital device in your pocket today. Your children probably do as well. You know, smartphones are now penetrating down to as low as 12 and 13 year olds. My 18 year old son is iPad proficient. Now, this is the world we grew up in now. He, you know, his handwriting may be terrible, but he knows how to get around to Angry Birds. You know, it's very, very simple, different, different, but different, dramatically changes. A huge, huge shift, and this is one of the things that banks really, really get. Opinion has been democratised. Forget that it's done by Facebook, Twitter and so forth. Opinion has been democratised to levels which will amaze people. I'll give you an example, the most in-your-face example in the world. Egypt after decades was essentially ruled by an autocratic leader, a leader that was unstoppable. Yet at the start of last year, in a population of 82 million people, 12,000 Twitter accounts overthrew the government. 12, that's where it started. A week before the Arab Spring, there was only 12,000 Twitter accounts in Egypt. Now, I'm not sure if you guys are aware how big, large uh, Twitter penetration is in the G20 nations. Other than China, which controls things, or even Saudi Arabia, 
There is not a single nation on the world that is safe from the exact same scenario. There is more Twitter followers in every G20 nation than the amount of votes it took to win the last election. That's a significant change in how opinion gets spread. Ideas spread at such pace that days are such a long time. In a place where banks usually take about 30 to 60 days to do an external comms process. And that just won't suffice in a world that is this fast. And not only that, that opinion is democratised in such a diverse range of platforms. Now, everyone talks about LinkedIn and Facebook, but you, who knows all of these platforms? These are all potential platforms where your brands are spoken about, either positively or negatively, shared, you know, experiences shared, videoed, recorded, documented, over and over and over again. Okay? Basically, we have right now the most documented time in history. The amount of data we produce on a daily basis is a plethora higher than what we were doing 10 years ago. And that includes what people think, act, do with your companies today. You know, some fascinating data is, and I won't go through all these statistics here, but you know, YouTube, one of, one, of, one of Google's businesses, in just one minute on, on YouTube, 30 hours of video is viewed. That means, you, know, you do your maths, how many concurrent videos are currently being watched in parallel on YouTube? Six million people log on to Facebook in a, in a minute. These are platforms for interactions at scales that, you know, they are far beyond most of the quantums we've seen in the past. The reality is, is the people we talk about grow up in a world where these are their service providers. These are their blockbuster and borders. Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, iTunes Store, Spotify. New distribution models for essentially intangible goods and services are now dominating the world. iTunes is the largest seller of music today in the world by a long, long way. Amazon, the largest seller of books by a long, long way. And they've actually been for, you know, uh, forward thinking enough to realise they need to pivot as well because they have to go beyond just the digital store. They have to go to digital distribution as well. So they've got businesses like Kindle and eBooks now coming out, which will actually take it to the next level where the actual written material you buy in a book will no longer be physically sent to you. You'll get it digitally on your iPad, your Kindle, your Nook, your whatever device you have in your life. But one of the most important things, and I think you know, Mel and, and William both touched on this before, is modality shift. The idea is that within a, in a digitally distributed world, with a device this powerful in your pocket, anything is possible. Anything. Every, the, most people's service expectation today is that their first point of call for a Google search is their pocket. Their first point of call to find a restaurant is their pocket. Well, think about all those scenarios in your everyday life today, which change the way you expect service providers to do. For instance, we are still not at a level where if you need a new bank account or a credit card, can I do that in my pocket yet? Unfortunately, no. Customer acquisition on the mobile device is not yet possible. We still need to look at some of the traditional distribution models in, in, in the financial services world. So let's do a self-reflective exercise. This is bank. This is, this is, you know, actually raise your hand. Who works for a bank here? So look, at, look in the mirror. This is what banks look like. The reality is that banks really are just very mature gentlemen's clubs that have been around for 200 years. They're trusted, with, they're trusted to hold your money and distribute that in controlled economic ways. Except when they have a financial crisis and lose all these lend leverage lending and so forth. But banks don't look very dissimilar to this. In fact, you could go to any board in the world and it would look, add some colour and maybe some new interior decorating, your bank probably looks like this. What does that mean? I mean, how many of you still carry around a leather pouch full of gold coins? Not many people. How many people still carry around a wad of cash? And if you're in Vietnam, this would be hard to carry around even 100 US dollars. <laughs> Lastly is, how many of you carry around a checkbook? These are evolutions of money that we've already gone through. That have already changed the banking industry massively. The shift from gold coins to cash, from cash to checks. We've seen plastic in the last couple of decades as well, the idea of cards. The reality is, is today's money is digital. Over 99% of all, all financial transactions in the world are nothing more than ones and zeros passed through an electronic world. Very few, and unless, unless you go to an emerging market, is, is it actually, you know, does it go beyond just the passing of ones and zeros? 
And in that digital world, something happened. With a democratised opinion, with the ability to say that, okay, if the bank pisses me off, I actually now have an avenue to share that with my friends, tell people. This, this slide, does anyone know where this came from? Has anyone heard about the Bank of America credit, credit card crisis on YouTube just two years ago? Where a lady, basically, her, she, she was a lifetime, lifetime banker with Bank of America. She'd had her credit card paid on time every month for 12 years. Bank of America to try, decided to change her per annum interest rate from 18% up to 30%. This happens all the time in banks, only it usually falls on deaf ears and the customer sucks it up and has to live with it. She did something very, very unique in 2010. She recorded a YouTube video ranting about this, that YouTube was viewed by 16 million people in three days. It was actively, you see here, people actively protest against, banks, bank, against Bank of America. Consumer outage got to such significant levels that Bank of America had to reverse that decision and reinstate her old interest rate. This is the reality of a bank today. You piss off one customer, it's no longer they'll tell 10 friends, they can now quickly tell a million people and have it documented. One of the challenges we have in the post-financial crisis world is exclusion. Despite, you know, Gates giving up $50 million and the USA giving up another $50 million around how do we do more financial inclusion in the world so we can bankroll India, we can bankroll China and so forth, the reality is at an overwhelming level, the, the post-financial crisis world, credit has been tightened up. Processes have been tightened up. Many of you would have seen this as processes got very, very diligent internally around lending practices, what you can and can't trade. Okay, that excluded people over and over again. And what did this do? It just pissed people off again. This got shared over and over again. We saw Occupy Wall Street. We saw Occupy London. We saw massive movements again post-financial crisis. But then we saw something very, very significant, and this is where the shift happened. And if you ask Malcolm Gladwell, this is where the tipping point is. We now have voluntary exclusion. People opting out of banks. The largest growing financial product in the world today is the green dot prepaid, pre prepaid card in the United States. This is a non-bank financial institution providing an everyday spending card which you buy at your local convenience store. Register it online and it's active. It works like your current debit card, ATM card, credit card, or whatever, and to use your everyday expenditure. This is not a bank. Growing at 37% per annum. That's unheard of in the banking world. This is disintermediating everyday banking. So it's un you know, unlikely because this this guy here, he doesn't want the paper forms, he doesn't want the branch, he doesn't want those, those you know, forced on him interactions around his financial service. So he'll go to his local convenience store, which is probably within a kilometre or so of his house, and get a more convenient product. One of the challenges, again, in the post-financial crisis world is the idea of transparency. People want to see more information from people. What is my bank doing with my money? Is it secure? Is it safe? We saw Northern Rock go under. We saw a number of banks get challenged or bailed out around basically mismanaging people's funds. And people start asking questions. That's a very, very important thing. People start asking questions. Even if they don't have the answers, they start essentially breaking the trust down. Do I really trust my bank? The reality is, is in the modern world, you, every one of you, probably trust your 108 friends on Facebook more than you actually trust your bank. You trust the opinion of those 108 friends. When you research your latest shoes, your latest mobile phone, you might even get you know, some, advice, some investment advice or my mortgage advice from that, that, those, 10, those 108 friends. I say 108 friends because that is the, the global average, the number, number of friends people have on Facebook. Essentially, it means the trust has shifted from a regulated body to my peer group. Again, in a democratised world, that's a very, very hard thing to overcome. So I come back to our blind, independent old man. What is he going to do? He's faced with a challenge. He comes with 200 years of legacy in a world that's shifting at a pace that he cannot keep up with. He's got to find a way to survive. So what are we looking at? We have to change. You know, I've been preaching change for nearly five years now, but the 2008 Obama campaign was built on exactly what appeals to the Gen X and Gen Y. 
Obama was voted into power because he promised change. It's actually overwhelmingly, as most people here would say, we need, this needs to change. Something needs to change. The way my bank delivers services needs to change. The way I do things that are inconvenient in my life need to change. So this guy got power of the most powerful nation in the world just by promising change. But in this new world, it has to be about the individual. It's about my life. What do I do? Where are my daily interactions? Where do I go, where do I go through in my, in, in, in my daily movements? Do I catch a train? Do I catch a taxi? Do I fly around the world? These are important things because in those things, services have to work in that lifestyle, in that life, my life. Because Facebook works in that world, Google works in that world, my smartphone works in that world, Spotify, iTunes, Netflix, Amazon, all work in that world. So that expectation of service translates to apparel industries as well. And what it's actually brought about is change. Change in a very massive way. Four huge brands there right now. Disintermediating banking in the United States. PayPal, as I said, 12 years old. Currently putting $12 billion a year, which you'll see in later, just on their mobile offering. This is $12 billion in the United States. It's a massive chunk of money that you guys are no longer processing. PayPal's doing it now. PayPal is the brand that people will go to when they think about, oh, I owe Johnny 10 bucks for dinner. I'll PayPal it to him. They no longer think about cash. They no longer think about, do I go in and through putting my, his branch code and his bank code and his account code and hope I've typed his name right and it's press send on internet banking. I can just PayPal it to him. Send it to his email address and he receives it on the other side. Square has completely disintimated the US merchant market. Bank simple, simplifying the online experience of banking. Douala has actually gone to the core. They've built their own new clearinghouse in the United States. Real-time clearing. None of this T plus one, T plus two, T plus three scenarios, real time, account to account. So look at the, let's look at the numbers, Square. One of the challenges I have in bankers' opinions of Square, as I say, it's coming, it'll never really get off the ground. Oh, they have this stupid little reader. It's based on Magstripe. Square's innovation is not the reader. Square's innovation is not, Mag, is not the Magstripe. Square's innovation is the fact that they offer merchant acceptance as a service. Anyone can sign up to become a merchant and then accept credit cards. If the United States market moves to EMV or NFC and so forth, Square is ready for that because all they have to do is change the front end interaction. Importantly here though, look at this. One eighth of all merchants in the United States are now Square merchants. This is not coming, this is mainstream volume. They are, within the, they are in the top 10 merchant providers in the United States already. Now there's alternate providers like this coming to, coming to Asia. We've seen Swift, they have an offering in Asia and other offerings as well, where they can dis completely disintermediate the relationship the bank has with small businesses, just on an acceptance point of view. Again, a huge, huge leap. They're going to take your SME business. It should be an alert. Anyway, PayPal, as I said before, they did $4 billion last year and are on track to do $12 billion this year. Huge volumes, real mainstream volumes, not coming here already taking your business. Number of offerings already in the mobile space. Many of them are not bank-led. You can look at here that there's pos, there's POS devices now on iPads that completely disintimate, the, the, again, the SME POS businesses you have. There's Google Wallet that's very successful in the United States doing a, a prepaid debit card. Just like the, the green dot card I mentioned before, only instead of being plastic issued, it's cell phone issued. I have this today. When I go to the United States, I always use my Google Wallet. It's more convenient. It's interactive. It's a very, very important shift. And the last one there is Visa and MasterCard are also trying to put a shift in this, into this space as well. Visa in investing a lot of money, incentivizing the London Olympics to be the first cashless Olympics. So your contactless Samsung phone will work at all the venues. So coming back to the consumer again, is that consumers now have influence. The power has shifted from the bank. No longer does the bank have the comfort to say, Look, if you come into our branch, fill out all this paperwork, give us 150 fields of stuff, we'll copy your passport, your driver's license, and we might let you become a customer. That is no longer a power position in the real world. It's flipped around now. The consumer will decide who fits my offering. And if you don't fit my offering or if you annoy me, I'm going to share it amongst my peers. So what do we need to do? We need to think about a different approach. Many of you aren't pilots in the world, but you would can probably appreciate that landing on this, on this piece of tarmac is going to be difficult. 
you probably don't take the same approach to this airport that you do to Changi. For you to know, Changi is a fully automated airport. Rarely does anyone touch the controls when they actually land a plane. This is very different. I, I don't see any automation features here. This is very different. You have to start thinking that technology is a part of your business. It's no longer a cost center. Now, there's only one bank in here in Singapore that actually has ma making this shift. The reason that the, the, the Dewalas, the PayPals, the Squares of the world is they don't have a business and a technology department. They're all one team. Everyone has a deep intrinsic understanding of technology and its possibilities. Developers sit next to analysts, next to strategy people. They are in one team. There is no cost center all allocation. This is a huge mental shift that a bank is going to have to do in the next 10 years. Otherwise, Timmy and Isaac, you'll never bank them. You have to understand that customer engagement is more than just an account number. Customers have multiple interactions in their world. They have their social media. They have multiple touch points. They might come into a branch, but they also might use an iPad. They might have an iPhone, various devices in their life. They interact with their peers as well. They exchange transactions with their peers, with the businesses around them. Understanding the world that they live in is important for you decide, deciding uh, on the, de de sorry, the design decisions for your products of the future. And you have to embrace the idea of multi-channel. One of the challenges banks have today is that if I look at these three platforms or four platforms, many of them would actually be in, in different verticals internally with around channel. Mobile channels over here. I'm not sure about tablet. Is that online or is that mobile? Uh, then internet banking's over here. But then SME internet banking's over here. And there's a whole other one for investments and trade over here. They never even speak. I mean, I don't want to point anywhere, but I've, many of you might have read my frustration on my blog with Standard Chartered for this one. I have a lot of credit. I give a lot of credit to Standard Chartered for their good products. But they have, don't have a multi channel consistent experience across all of their verticals. Frustrates me as a customer. So that they're straight to bank, their business offering, as I as a business customer, does not meet the expectations I have, which I get from Breeze. This is very, very frustrating for me as a customer. We have to realize that mobility is key now. Just as I said, with all those other services that are already in your pocket, your bank has to be powerful in your pocket. And it must have ubiquitous utility. It must work everywhere. It must be simple. You know, there can't be limitations. I mean, one of my frustrations, I'm sorry Google, but I hate that Google Wallet doesn't work in Singapore. It works only in the United States. It's around how do you make ubiquitous utility work for every single service you offer. It doesn't matter if it's FX, payments, point of sale transactions. It has to be ubiquitous and it has to have mobility. Essentially embracing the idea is it has to work at any time. You know, doing your banking at 11 o'clock at night. It has to work anywhere here on the beaches of Thailand. Always banking, never at a bank. This is a new teller. This guy, the market stall in San Francisco, selling you know, hippie diet tip, uh, dyed t-shirts. There is no reason why he cannot have a square offering today to accept credit card payments for those t-shirts he's selling. And actually this guy does. To bring it back to, to an Asian theme here, so you really have to understand the lifestyle that people live. I've got a number of scenarios here that happen in Singapore every day. We've got hawker centers that are still very, very cash, all those prepaid CoopTM cards dependent. There's a huge opportunity. The amount of transaction volume that happens there in there today is massive. In fact, if you could turn that to digital versions, it would you know, threefold your current payments business. The idea of shopping is how do you make the shopping experience more, more, more pleasurable? Because unfortunately, the most un unfortunate part of shopping is how much money do I have to spend today on this impulse purchase? I want to buy those shoes. Can I afford it? Those kind of scenarios, how do you make those things more enriching? How do you make, for instance, disposable income, disposable expenses today, more enriching as an experience, not just, oh, my balance is $100. The idea that you have to understand, like the family down here, there is multiple life, life milestones that are going to be facilitated. And the reality is, is a lot of those will be, you know, passed through the generations of that family. They'll determine the banking products and relationships you choose. They'll determine your opinions, your perspectives on the world. I use this slide as one of the concrete illustrations of everything I've just said in one summary. Remember I just gave you the case of the lady whose uh, credit card interest rate was hiked by 12%. This is the analytics side of it. This is actually showing the three month period after her credit card interest rate was changed. And what it actually did to the Bank of America share price. 
amazing numbers here where you can actually see the sentiment. You can actually see the sentiment is the blue, is, is the blue and the, st the stock price is the green. What we'd actually see here is in every case, social media sentiment predicts drops by a number of days, every single time. It also predicts the rises as well. It's no wonder that one of the biggest R&D aspects right now is social media sentiment algorithmic trading. Does anyone know what that means? So basically it means it's listening to social media to decide your stock purchases. Bank of America suffered massively from one incident with one lady. Look at the share price fall over the period, over a three month period. Phenomenal. If this happened to your bank, it'd be like, this would, this would be the response. So it's time to transform. And I like to use the, the story of the caterpillar turning into a butterfly, modernizing for a new world. Is that no longer you sit around very sluggish and just eating up everything you possibly can and embracing beauty, embracing some things around grace in a new digital world. An important first part of this, and this is, you know, if anyone works for any of those agencies, the IDOs, the, the frog designs, the sapiens of the world, this is something they've embraced for nearly 12, you know, for over a decade. User-centered design, listening to the customer before, the, before you design the product. What is the experience they want? Where in their daily life are they going to interact with your product? Potentially become a customer. Talk about your product. You know, understanding that is actually a very, very key, key part of building successful products. Well, I, I, I said this two days ago on the stage at Communicasia is around, I get frustrated. I spent a lot of time doing mobile money over the last five years. Mobile, mobile money is the, the idea of using cell phones to do inclusive banking in emerging markets. Unfortunately, there's one huge case success, success study in Kenya called M-Pesa. And Pacer has seen a phenomenal growth. Growth that cannot be copied anywhere else in the world. The problem is, is everyone thinks, oh, it's all right, I don't have to listen to the user. I'll just copy what M-Pacer did and do it in Vietnam or Indonesia or the Philippines. The reality is those markets are not the same. No one in the Philippines has an 80% market share like, like Safaricom had on day one of, of, of their launch of M-Pacer. No one has the market demands of a, a completely devastated banking infrastructure they had in Kenya. It's around how do you listen to the user first? before you make design decisions on the services you're going to offer. You have to transform your businesses to be digital. Everyone in the bank is digital. Everyone. That goes from compliance to the janitor. They all have to live and breathe digital because that's the world you're in. The reality is, is you think about what's the biggest digital asset in your bank today. It's actually probably one of the oldest. It's your core banking system. Mainframes are digital. That's where you keep your assets. So why are you not digitizing the rest of that, that customer journey as well? We also have to really think about, I understand that there is, a, there is a need still for the idea of physical space, but that physical space's role has to change. It no longer becomes the idea of this big glass panel, the, you know, the, oak, the oak bench of doing a teletransaction. It can still become a place of relationship. It can still become a place of branding. I mean, everyone keeps talking about the Apple store of banking, which you know, Citibank is doing, OCBC is doing, and so forth. But it has to really change a different role, and that role has to be user-centric. Customers, customers' experiences have to be consistent. It doesn't matter where they interact with your, your bank. They'll, have, they'll come in with preemptive expectations of what they're expecting, and it has to flow. It has to flow. It has to be seamless. As I said, I'm going to say this again and again and again. Technology is your business. Is your business. Technology enables nearly 99% of everything you do today. Appreciate the idea that the relationship matters, not on an account level. Stop asking me for my account number. I am Scott. I am Scott Bales. Realize that as a personal relationship and recognize that. And, ha and translate it into how you actually understand my world. Und understanding the idea of, you know, we had CRM concepts come out 15 years ago, yet I haven't seen one single bank actually fully realize all of the objectives of CRM of managing the holistic relationship, of actually getting deeper understanding of their consumers. And there's a plethora of data out there today which should be fed into your CRM systems. Social media data, transactional data, like all the stuff you already have, you're not using that to enrich the relationship. Be open to the idea of agents. Agents are your biggest asset. Why? Because one of the biggest current overheads you have in your business is your physical distribution. Those thousand branches you have across a region at nearly two, you know, what, two, three million dollars of property per annum. Reality is, is you could release an entire digital strategy on the cost of about a branch. 
but finding yourself di different ways to distribute. let look at if look at Africa. Africa's done this very well. MTN and Standard Bank has a fantastic partnership across the continent to distribute mobile money accounts. MTN has now all of its outlets right across Africa, are now the branches of Standard Bank. You can do deposits, withdrawals, sign up, and so forth. It's around how do you find partnerships for, di for distribution? And most importantly, engage in the social space of your consumer. Use that as data to understand, not just a fan page. You know, really understand is what's behind that around demographical data to understand more about their likes and dislikes, who they associate with, what are the brands that are important in their life. I really like putting, I like putting up you know, superheroes. This is a Singaporean superhero, Mr. Digital Superbanker. I have disguised his identity by putting glasses on it. Some of you may be able to see through those glasses. But so these are some of the comments that he actually made at Next Bank Asia, what, about two months ago. Around, again, look, he, he, his very first tip was, technology is your business. This guy runs a retail banking operation here in Singapore. The idea of how can you embrace the idea to experiment and fail? Learn from those experiences. Unfortunately, banks are too scared about failure, so they don't even start the first step. You know, how do you plan to grow big? How do you actually sweat the small stuff? You know, the, around the process of driving things, around the design is important, the user experience is important, and stress these things. Don't fly solo. You know, appeals to my agent slide that I just mentioned. But the important thing there is the customer owns the customer. Doesn't matter where you are in the world, the customer owns the customer. They own themselves. They have the best understanding of who they are. You don't own them. They will always put hold this against you because they will swap you tomorrow. Now the idea of here, down the bottom here is another one is around, made famous by an author, uh, uh, James Gardner, is around, have a long view, but be prepared to pivot. Change course. You know, essentially shift based on some market feedback. But the boring, the, the most important thing here at the bottom, and this is, appeals to everyone, anyone who's in culture or HR or, or recruiting teams right now in banks, at the bottom, boring people don't build great experiences. Okay? And unfortunately, I'm going to make a generalisation here, a lot of bankers are very boring. <laughs> so the question we're left with, what am I missing? So I'm going to give some hard numbers here to your world. Let's look at the region. Asia has a phenomenal opportunity sitting right in front of it. If you look down here, 61% of cell phones in Singapore are smartphones. Australia uh, and Hong Kong are not far behind, but the important thing there is that 80% of all first-time phone buyers now buy smartphones. This should be an important input to understand your consumer around how you now tailor and build services. Some huge numbers here, 80% penetration of, of, of mobile. That's four times higher than online, than, the, than PC ownership. So four times more people have access to your services via mobile than via internet banking. You know, if over, overwhelming the numbers, don't you ask me if you ask McKinsey or Forster or any of those research groups, over 50% now say that mobile is key to deciding my banking relationship. I can personally put my hand up and say I bank with Standard Chartered because of Breeze. That's a consumer choice I have made. The, the really important thing here is that the banks keep saying we're going after high net worth, they're the most profitable market and so forth. Look at this number at the bottom right. By the year 2020, that's eight years away, people that are actually currently choosing their primary banking relationship, there'll be 3.2 billion middle class in Asia. People that most likely don't have a banking relationship right now are going to have their, their decisions shaped by everything that I've just said over the last 30 minutes. I've got two minutes left, damn. <laughs> More specifically, let's look at Indonesia, the fastest growing Facebook market in the world, one of the highest growing cell phone penetrations in the world. You know, Look at this, 40% of all internet traffic in Indonesia is on mobile. They are the largest consumer of mobile internet in the world. They are the largest Twitter market in the world. These are important numbers when you start deciding around your products. This is understanding your consumer. And in the interest of time, that's a, a very quick summary, so if anyone gets my slides, that's everything I've said in, in about two seconds. But four key points I need you to take away. First and foremost, understand your consumer behaviour. Take into account everything I've just told you. Ask questions of your consumers. Understand what they do. Where do they want to bank? How do they want to bank? Technology is the business now. It's not a cost centre. It's the business. Create brilliant experiences. 
Remember, the consumer's benchmark for experience now is Facebook, Twitter, Path, Amazon. They're your benchmarks for service, not your competitor. And the last one, innovate. Just do something. Try something. Try something tomorrow. It doesn't matter if it's this big or a, giant, a huge project. Try something. Stop making excuses and step forward. If you want to learn more, here's, my, here's the three books I highly recommend. Start with, start with Why, Simon Sinek, which will actually help you understand asking the questions of why are you doing things. It gets the root of the success of services like Apple. This is where you'll hear why Apple is so successful. The third screen, huge, huge depth of knowledge around mobility and its impact to going forward. And last is my business partner's book, Bank 2.0, around the transformational banking. I'm going to skip the moving bank slides. It's really in the interest of time. But the idea is I actually am right now building a bank embracing all of this. Ask myself, what would Google do? Well, I've built a bank that is mobile-centric. Mobile is the first priority. It embraces three key pillars around mobile ecosystem is the highest priority. Implementing user experience design processes coming from some of the best world leaders. The idea of word clouds and so forth. And the idea around creating a transparency score which we can gamify to help you spend, save and live smarter. So we give you everyday feedback around your spending behaviour, your savings behaviour, your livability, your social ability, your opinions and so forth to actually help over a period of time give you a better, a better position with your money. It's not about mobile, yes, is, is an answer, but it's not about the mobile. It's about how do we help that experience with the, with the consumer. So back to, Tim, to back to Timmy, one last point. Is Timmy, as I said, who was as old as the first smartphone, will be a high net worth individual in 2030. So I ask your question, you know, given all those banks that want to go after high net worth individuals, you have to bank this guy in 2030. That's me. Uh, again, I, I highly encourage you to try something new. Uh, you can see a few details there, my Twitter account and so forth. I publish my very eccentric thoughts on banking on my blog, Money Mesh. Uh, feel free to contact me anytime you want. Um, and I think I'm sticking around at the end for a Q&A, aren't I? Yep, you know, right. Thank you very much. Thank you.